Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. This week is special. You all know I'm dedicated to helping us heal religious trauma wounds and live our happiest, healthiest, most authentic lives. And today's topic helps us do that through healing the learned money and wealth limiting beliefs that many of us picked up as a byproduct of familial and religious teachings. So For many of us, our hearts yearn to live lives where we're free to be generous with ourselves, our families, and our friends, as well as make a positive impact in the world. A quick trigger warning, we will be talking about infertility in this episode. We will be talking about postpartum depression and suicidal ideation for brief moments at the beginning of the episode. So be aware of that and let me welcome my guest. My guest today will be walking us through common myths about money we may have picked up from our childhood and how we work through those myths in order to be financially healthy ourselves and pass on healthier ideas about money to our children and grandchildren. I feel so privileged to welcome Lisa Shader to the podcast. Lisa is a financial coach and the creator of MoneyFitMoms.com. She is passionate about educating women and families on how to make smart financial moves so they can build wealth, live well, and do good in the world. I was absolutely magnetized to Lisa's energy when I first met her on Instagram on her account, Money Fit Moms. We connected because of our very similar backgrounds with religious transition, but since then, the information she provides on social media and her YouTube channel have really helped me identify my learned stories I had about money and wealth, like AKA money is the root of all evil. You guys know what I'm talking about and start adopting healthier practices with the green goodness. We all want to both build a successful business and set my family up for a stable financial future. You will definitely want to follow her on all of the links I've provided in the show notes. And I am so excited to learn more from her today. And I'm happy you're all here for the adventure as well. So Lisa, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Terry. I am so excited to be here. I could talk, I do talk about this stuff forever. I had to finally set up a business so it wasn't weird when I started trying to help people with their finances. So it is my passion and I hope, uh, The nice thing is I'm not huge. I'm small. So if people send me messages, like be listening to this, thinking of questions and know that I'll be excited to help you because that's just why I do this. I love to help people. And yeah. So thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. And I I love that you said that I'm small and I'm going to be able to answer your messages and I'm going to be, it's part of the fun of doing what we do of being a coach is getting those social media messages and getting to interact back and forth with people and really help improve their lives. So yeah. I know it makes my day. I just joined TikTok and people are asking like, Hey, how do I contribute more to my 401k? And I'm like, this is how it, it's like the best thing that interaction I had that day is that someone wants to (laughs) contribute more to their 401k. So I'm weird. Like, just tell me that you got disability insurance to protect yourself. And I'm just like, Oh, it like, it does something to me. Like, tell me you just own, you know, you started tracking your budget. I'm weird. Like if you're like, who is going to be excited that I just set up my budget? Lisa's going to be excited. So I just like to, I'm a fish, you know, financial coach is my name, but I'm really more of a cheerleader. I just get so thrilled. And I, I don't expect anyone to be at any certain point. You know what I mean? When they come to me and start interacting. Um, so I, I just, I'm so excited to just have a new audience. Um, to be talking to, because I love it. Ah, 
I'm so thrilled that you're here. Okay, so tell me about your background because all of us have like reasons we get so passionate about things. So tell me about your background and why you're so passionate about finances. Yes. Okay. So I was a, I don't know, nerd growing up, I guess Mm. (laughs) is the best way to say it. (laughs) I was, I mean, I just had this brain. Honestly, it probably was partially anxiety. I didn't want to get in trouble with the teacher. So I was that perfect student. I got in trouble, quote unquote, like twice in all of my school career. And I remember because it was so traumatic. So I was really fortunate to get a scholarship into college and all these things. Um, And I was able to get into a really competitive accounting program and get into their master's degree. And I got a CPA, which is now inactive because I'm not, it's, you know, for a certified public accountant and I'm not working in public accounting right now, but you know I mean? I did all these things, but I was also in a high demand religion that told me it's okay to get an education, but really your life goal is to get married and to have kids. And I am really good at meeting expectations. So I was married at 20. I got a master's degree, but it really was basically one extra year onto my undergrad. I basically felt like I was just playing the game of telling people, yeah, I want a career in accounting, even though I did love it. Um, But I was like, no, really, really what I want to do, like, this is a backup. I want to get married, stay at home, have many kids. And so I did that. I got pregnant and then I quit, right? Like I went on maternity leave, but really thinking I'm not going to come back and got hit by a bus because I had the most severe postpartum anxiety. It exacerbated to the point because I couldn't sleep or eat. I was honestly eventually hospitalized. I like after a few months, you know what I mean? It just deteriorated to the point where I couldn't function anymore. And now it's the most obvious thing in the world that I went from being this like super type A, you know, I was working at a big four accounting firm, working crazy to all of a sudden be like, okay, now stay at home. We had just moved to uh, California and I didn't really have a community because I worked. And then I went to stay at home. I was home alone with a baby. This is like the really, really long story, but I know that postpartum mental health issues are common and I'm an advocate. So I'm just putting it out there just because I think it removes some of the shame to be like, oh, she was that sick and she's okay. Anyway, I got so sick, couldn't function, actually had doctors tell me I think you should consider going back to work part-time. I think that's, you know, adding to the problem. And I ignored them because I thought I know better. Like they don't know what God wants me to do. I have to, I have to be the best mom, which means being a stay at home mom. That's what I thought. And I just fought that. And eventually, you know, I think it honestly took longer because I wanted to do it my way or God's way or whatever I perceived. Um, so eventually I did get better. But I, I started to be drawn. I did like to help people with their finances. So I started a blog with my friend, but under the guise of like, okay, we're only doing this during nap time. Like we're not going to get big. We're not going to need childcare. Uh, but it did sort of take off. Um, and then as soon as it started to become something that we would maybe need to work outside of nap time, and then we both had a second child, I shut it down because I thought this is not okay to succeed. Like I can't actually make money or need childcare, then I'm stepping away from my lifetime role of perfect stay at home mom. Right. I was afraid of success. So I shut that down and really just went full on into motherhood and homemaking, whatever, you know what I mean? I found ways around that. I realized that was not where my joy is. I just needed to be full on into something. And then I had a third kid by my second one. I kind of skated through the postpartum issues, third child, hit it again. And it wasn't as bad because we were prepared for how bad it could get if we didn't intervene sooner, but it was still like horrible. My mom had to come help me. I really needed help for months just to be able to get to the point where like, I mean, really I was suicidal. Like that's how bad it got, which sounds insane, but really it was a function of my brain and the hormones just could not function. I felt like I And so it was that bad. And at that point, also uh, (laughs) reading my scriptures, read something that incited a 
I honestly, I say the term, like your shelf broke, you have all these issues. I didn't think I had any issues until that day because I lost everything in an instant. But because I was going through these postpartum issues, it's like, okay, it could be because of that. Like, that's why my husband kind of ignored it. Cause he thought, okay, she's not in a good place. Like, of course she's having this. So I started seeing a therapist. I don't know. Basically I ignored any religious questions I had until I was in a good place mentally because I couldn't handle it. I was falling apart. I couldn't all of a sudden have this existential crisis. Put the, oh my gosh, sorry. This is such a long story, but this is what your podcast is about, right? So this is good. Okay. So I put that on hold, got to a good, healthy place. <laughs> and so my husband was shocked because I'd been like healthy, thriving, doing well for months. Everything was good. And then there was a I know you like support all religions, so I don't want to like use speak. That's only to one religion. But I basically got a calling that I initially accepted, but then turned down because I realized, I mean, had stopped believing months and months ago, but I just kind of ignored it. But I was like, I can't, I can't do this. And so that was like when I actually had to be like, okay, I'm in a good place. You know what I mean? Like I need to work through all this. Like you said, the deconstruction. And so when I brought it up to my husband, he was shocked because he really just was like, oh, that was that crazy thing that you only were dealing with because you had postpartum issues. This was not real. It was extremely difficult, as you know, because you don't realize what a high demand religion you are in until you leave. And then you realize this is everything. This is what I do with my time. These are my friends. This is going to affect all my family relationships. It needed a lot of attention. And so I had to give it that attention. And I really couldn't do much of anything else other than deal with all of this. It was all encompassing for that year. And then by the time, you know, I was working through that, I I was sort of addicted to the vindication of all these people around me think that I'm wrong. I think that I'm right. And I just spent so much time reinforcing how I felt. And I realized this is good, but at the same time, it's time for me to move on to something else. And so I started kind of reevaluating what I wanted to do with my life, quote unquote. And I had found a lot of joy in therapy, you know, it had changed my life in therapy. So I actually went to an open house to get a master's in therapy. And I was prepared to throw all my financial background out the window and get a degree in therapy because really, you know, I took all these quizzes and I'm like, what I want to do is I want to ease people's suffering, make people's lives better. And that's what I wanted to do. And I thought that's the way to do it. And at some point, I don't remember how I started interviewing people who were therapists. And I just started to realize that all this time that I had spent learning about finances and writing about them for my blog, that I didn't need to throw that out the window. And actually finances are a huge, you know, a lot of mental suffering comes from stress and finances are a huge source of stress. They're a factor in most, if not all separations or divorces. And it's sad that it took me that long to realize, oh, I have value. I have something to add and I don't need to just throw out who I used to be and just kind of transition into a new thing. So I started... Uh, I took some additional courses. I mean, obviously I've had this background. I've been writing about it, but I took some additional courses and then started financial coaching and realizing it's basically, I can't say it's financial therapy because that's actually a regulated term. You can become an official financial therapist where you have to either have a you know, CFP or an MLFT. You know what I mean? It's like you come from the official certification of the background, but that's kind of what it's like. It's kind of like therapy when you talk about these finances. And so I fell in love with it. And then um, I rebuilt a new blog and built this, what I call the money fit challenge so that I could help as many people as possible. Cause I love the one-on-one, but I am a busy mom. And so I was like, okay, how can I scale this? Because it was changing people's lives. And so that's that's kind of where I am today and why I went on social media, even though it was the hardest thing. I hate putting myself out there. The first time I made a little video or did a little live, it was me talking to myself for 20 minutes. Like, you can do this. It's okay. Like, it's fine. So putting myself out there is not my goal. I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm, I don't need to have a million followers, but um, I love helping people with their finances. So that is the long, 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 long 
long story. Oh, and also why I started helping women in particular is because I started um, working with people and just realizing that I was fortunate to have a bachelor's in accounting, a master's in accounting. I I was in taxes, so I was helping a people file individual. You know, I mean, you get every part of it and realizing that what was intimidating to other people was just me living my best life. And so, and I realized how terrifying it is to women. You know what I mean? The way that I feel about, I'm trying to think of the equivalent. I am not great with cars. <laughs> the, the, that kind of things that come to other people. I tell people interior decorating is not my thing. So when I talk to people and they just, I walk in their home and they just have it. And I tell them, you should become an interior decorator. And they're like, no, like this is nothing. I'm said, you don't realize that what comes naturally to you does not come naturally to me. I would pay you to decorate my house. And they're like, what? So I think just realizing um, that it is intimidating for people. And, and so getting into that, not because I know so much, but because I love it and I want to help take away that intimidation factor. And I realize how common it is sadly for if you're in a religion that is patriarchal, um, it sows the seeds for what is sadly financial abuse. And that is a strong word, but basically if I just, I started to realize how common it was for women to not only not know about what their financial situation is, but not even to have access to all their accounts, to not even know what all their accounts were. And that had not been my experience because my husband and I took a personal finance class together, which really was just luck. And then I got, I realized that even fellow accountants struggled with their finances. We had just early on been really fortunate to kind of adopt these habits. And we were like nerds. We had monthly budget meetings and we would go over our budget week by week, but that, that allowed us to have this equality in our finances. But even then when I left, I found myself feeling and all throughout, um, I don't know, struggling with the idea that I was not the main breadwinner and I had to deconstruct all that and what that meant. The fact that we had essentially invested in my husband's career. And so my earning potential would never, could never be what his was, which is not entirely true, but in some ways, you know, cause I always talk about investing is it, it is an investment. So yeah, I just realized that I, even though I knew most likely only women would listen to me because that's the sad, you know, patriarchal society. I realized, cause at first I put my, my name as money fit life because I thought, okay, like I'm for everyone. I, it doesn't matter who you are. And then I realized that ultimately it was probably only going to be people who identified with who I am that would listen to me. And I realized that's okay. That's who I want to talk to anyway. Honestly, that's who I'm concerned about are the people who do feel at a disadvantage. So that was when I leaned into the money fit moms. Not, and I have people who follow me who are not moms, who are not women, but primarily that's who I speak to. So anyway, <laughs> that's tell me if, anyway, follow-up questions. That's the long story. Oh my gosh, that was so much good information. Like I almost wished I was taking notes halfway through because you brought up so many good things. First of all, there is a reason that I am so magnetized to you. Like I like stalk your account all the time. And I think it's because honestly, like I identify with that type A personality that you described. And I identify with my, my mental health issues started whenever I became a stay-at-home mom. So we had infertility issues for 10 years. We adopted our first son seven years in and I quit my job. So I quit my job, went home, stayed at home with my, with my son. And that's when things really started unraveling because just like you said, you're home alone all the time. I really fed off of the achievement in the work world. I really fed off of being with other people and helping people and having like, like learning and expanding and growing and um, as beautiful as it was to stay at home with my son, it was a completely unstructured, lonely kind of way of being. And my husband was in the military, so he was gone a lot. So it was really me and my son at home alone for days on end. And it really started the unraveling into clinical depression. And I really identify with you going to a therapist and 
he started telling me, you know, I really think that you are driven by achievement and maybe just staying at home isn't for you. And I really identified with you really kicking back against that and being like, no, this is the way it has to be done. Cause I'm a rule follower as well. And so I'm like, this, this is the plan. This is what I planned five, 10 years ahead of time. I know what I'm doing in this business five years from now, you guys, we got plans. We're going places. And so I had like my whole family mapped out for like 18, 20 years. I couldn't necessarily control when kids joined us, but I knew like what the plan was and what I was supposed to do as a mom and what I wanted that to look like. And that included like homeschooling and just all kinds of things. Like it was like you, I poured myself into something. I'm like, if I'm not working, like we're going to do this and we're going to do it perfectly, like as perfect as I possibly can. So I love how you got to that realization of, okay, I want to help women. And kind of like you, I thought I needed to toss out all of my previous experience. I was a wedding photographer for 10 years. You know, I was- That's funny. I'm a photographer too. We're basically the same person is what I'm hearing. (laughs) I love this. So it it sounds like you nerd out about finances and I nerd out about psychology. So kind of like you, I thought about becoming a therapist as well. Like I thought about going and getting a PhD and I thought, you know what? I need that so I can research and people will take me seriously. And then I talked to my husband and he's like, I can only practice in Colorado. If you get a PhD, he was like, you're going to be limited to Colorado. And I was like, no, 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 no. There are not people doing this work. So I'm going to become a coach so I can like reach a larger audience. Well, and also like you mentioned, you had invested in your husband and yeah, you had invested in your husband and you started realizing, well, that kind of limits what I'm capable of. Not really. We're going to talk about that, but it feels like that at first. And, um, just really trying to like process that and everything. So no wonder I am so magnetized to you because like, as you were telling your story, I'm like, it's me. I get it. (laughs) Um, Totally get that. And you brought up some great things about just like patriarchy and what it's like for women. And when you said that women, it sets us up, it grooms us for financial abuse. I I don't think that that is too strong of a word. When I started using the term religious trauma, people were like, no, it's not. And I was like, no, it really is traumatic. And there really is abuse that happens at church, not just what we typically think of as abuse, but there's like psychological manipulation and emotional manipulation. And it really does groom us for financial manipulation, several of my clients find themselves in this scary place of if I own the fact that I don't believe anymore and my spouse stays in and they decide to divorce me, I have no skills. A lot of them have no education. I don't know what to do with finances. I don't even know how much money we have or how much I can request. I don't have passwords to our bank accounts. I, I can't look. Some of the bank accounts I'm not even on. Some of my clients are not even on the deeds for their homes. So right. it's, I, I mean, it's insane. Yes. And that's exactly why I do what I do. And uh, when I, the money fit challenge, it's not like step one, start contributing to your Roth IRA. Step one is just to figure out what accounts you do have, right? And if someone says, I don't know what accounts, right? Like we can work from there because so many people just realize that if you feel that way, you are not alone. Sadly, you're normal. And that's why step one is like, okay, let's figure out what accounts you have and get access to them. And I literally, I'm some clients, it takes months to get to that point. Um, But the fact is good for them for realizing, oh, I am not where I want to be, right? Like that is step one is, so if, if you're hearing anything we're talking about, you're thinking, oh, that's me. I'm bad. I right, like, let that go and realize, no, I'm normal. And the fact that I'm gaining awareness to that, like, that's why the main word I use is empowering through personal finance, because that is what I think probably the biggest money myth or limiting belief that I deal with is people thinking that finances are scary. And so I'm better off avoiding and not confronting it because that helps me feel safe. And the truth is it's gnawing at the back of your mind, right? That, that insecurity about I'm not where either I don't know where I am or I am not where I want to be every time, like each of these steps, it's basically just a slow build to make you more aware 
of where you are and where you want to be, and then creating a path to get there. And every time, even when people say, I'm not where I want to be, they always follow up with, but I'm so glad that I figured this out because really a lot of what I do is just helping people get connected to these. And luckily we're in the age of information. There's these amazing tools that literally are so easy to set up that it's real. you know, you manage what you measure. It's basically, I'm just helping people get an awareness and build a dashboard so they can see where they are. And sometimes that is all people need, right? Like step one is, well, they set their why, right? Cause you know, like setting your, like, why am I doing this? Why is this worth taking time to do? And then step two is I have people uh, calculate their net worth and in the process, right? They round up their accounts and some people never even have to get to the part of budgeting because just tracking their net worth and seeing their accounts, which is easier than you think it is. There's tools that literally do it for you and you just have to log in. But just seeing that is enough for them to change their behavior, whether it's spending or whether it's, you know, with their retirement contributions. Um, you know, I work with some uh, some clients right now. I've been working with them for about maybe six months, five months. And we never had to start budgeting because all it took was I log in with them once a month, we update their accounts and they've literally paid off over $15,000 of debt just by setting the intention of, we want to do this. And then anytime they came into money, instead of thinking, oh, what do we want to buy? There's a million things they want to buy. They knew what their goal was. And so for the first, you know, one or two months, it's like, oh no, but I want to, I want to do this. And then about two or three months, your body adjusts to, okay, this is my new normal. And then now they're just on fire and, you know, it's amazing. And it really, all it was, was just having someone to check in with. That's my goal is to get people to DIY, like figure out how to do this on their own. That's why I set it up like I did. So this is not a pitch for coaching. I actually am going to be slowly getting away from coaching just because I want to be able to help as many people as possible. But anyway, the point is I give people the tools and that's all they need is to gain an awareness. And then all of a sudden it's really not that complicated. That's another limiting belief that I deal with a lot is people thinking finances are complicated and there's actually a really simple formula to building long-term wealth. It's a three-step formula, spend less than you earn, invest the rest and avoid debt. And obviously, you know what I mean? There's pieces in that, but it's really basic. And if people are in the debt payoff phase, it can feel intimidating, but it's still the same formula. It's just that before you start investing, you spend less than you earn, use that, that margin to pay off your debt. And then you go into investing. You know what I mean? It's just basically one extra step. And then it's like, that's it. It's really not rocket science. And, you know, there are limits to how much you can contribute to a Roth IRA, whatever. And that's why I showed up and I'm like, yes, like don't let little questions like that stop you or make you think, oh, if I don't understand this, then that's just the end. Then I just can't do this. It's like, no, I'll send a message to Lisa and she'll be like, hey, like, okay, this, you know what I mean? I just wanted to be that person that allowed people to not stop when they got intimidated and realized that there was a non-judgmental person who loves looking up the Roth IRA <laughs> contribution limits who wants to help them. Um, so yeah, those are just, I'm already diving right into limiting beliefs, but I, I listened to your episode about limiting beliefs and it just got me my gears going. Cause I think they affect every part of their life, but yeah, just realizing, um, you don't need to wait to do your finances till, you know, it doesn't have to become a part-time job. That's also what I do is I think about money. So you don't have to, my goal is to set up just basically systems that you check in with at least once a month, update it. You know what your next financial goal is. Some people do, a lot of people don't. So you know what you're going toward. You know what I mean? It's just like a few basic things that once you set up, it kind of drives itself. You just need to gain a little bit of an awareness. And so, yeah, that's that's why I do it. Oh my gosh, you bring up so many good things. I love seeing the parallels. So a lot of times we don't want to acknowledge or become aware of things because we feel shame about 
either what we feel like we're doing wrong or how we believe that we're wrong or what we don't know, the shame of not knowing something. And it sounds like that's a big limiting factor sometimes for people is they're like, I don't understand this. I don't want to admit to anyone that I don't understand this, or I don't want to admit to anyone I don't have access to my accounts or know how many accounts I have or any of that, or I don't know what my net worth is. And so that shame kind of keeps them from seeking help sometimes. But when you can take that step forward to seek the help, whether it's in a program online or just looking at the free information that's out there that you provide and that other people provide, just being aware of where you're at, awareness is always the first step to healing, always. And it, it sounds like it doesn't matter if you're healing emotionally and mentally or if you're healing financially, just bringing the problem up to the forefront, into the conscious and becoming aware of it allows you to then look at it from all different angles and get curious with it and figure out what you need to do and what feels best, like the next best step and really becoming aware of what you're actually accomplishing and what you're not, what's getting in the way. And it sounds like so often just allowing yourself to become aware, like taking that brave step forward to admit, I don't know what's going on, or I don't know what I have and don't have, and seeking out the help plus the awareness. And you brought up the other piece, the accountability. There really is something important, whether it's a coach, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a financial advisor or a friend or a spouse, keeping you accountable is a huge step forward in overcoming like old patterns and a lot of the patterns that we have, we either learned from, you know, our parents growing up. A lot of the patterns that I've had, I've learned from my family. My husband has learned from his or their coping mechanisms of some sort to help us. You know, I mean, some of us spend money to numb emotions or to feel better. Or when life is tough, we, we go and, you know, we go and spend something or do something that we weren't planning on doing to distract ourselves. And so yeah, this is like, this is all landing with me. This is good stuff. So I'm glad that you're diving right into the myths. No, I love it. And um, I think the biggest thing uh, that had to change when I, I, I don't know, I just felt like not a new person, but I didn't realize how much I had to shed off and leaving a patriarchal system. And that being said, I loved the patriarchy. I was not someone who had ambitions to change the status quo. I loved the status quo. It made me feel safe. I had no problems. I was never protesting anything. And despite that, I have a dear sister-in-law who asked me a couple times, why are you so much happier on the other side of this. And she's still in it. And just, right, there's a cognitive dissonance of why would you be happier? And she herself is a very strong, powerful woman. And the thing is, is she has to be where she is and she is a great contributor to where she is. And so I would never wanna say anything that makes her feel like she needs to be somewhere where she's not, but I had to be honest. I wanted her to be able to mitigate some of the negative effects of being where she is. And so I had to be honest that stepping away from a patriarchy did empower me so much because I didn't realize how I, I don't know, just put a, not a full on mute button, but I just turned my power way down. Cause I felt like, okay, I can't make waves. I can't, you know what I mean? And one of the best things I did is when I was making new friends to um, make some of my closest friend really strong, powerful women who are changing the status quo and whatever they're doing. One of them's a teacher and she's a rock star. The other one is she's a speech therapist, but she's also a huge political activist. And she spends, it's, it's a part-time job for her changing the world. And they are not afraid of their voices. And I was so empowered by them. It made me realize that I wanted to become powerful too, but it's not going to happen just by pretending. I The first thing that I had to do is to stop pretending that I knew what everyone was talking about all the time. And I thought that that made me seem smart because I don't need to ask questions because I'm just going to pretend like I know what they're talking about. And I realized how that was not serving me well. And so I made a commitment to myself that when I do not understand what's going on, I'm going to ask questions and if I don't understand their answer, I'm going to ask more questions and just keep coming back and realizing 
And, and, you know, if someone comes to you with a question, you don't think, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. You think good for them. Like they are empowering themselves. They're asking questions. They're gaining knowledge. So I don't know why I thought pretending I knew what everyone was talking about made me (laughs) smart, right? The best thing I did was to say, I need help. And I think that's what's happened to me since I started working while working. I I was always working, but once I started creating uh, my businesses and getting set up is I realized it's not that I all of a sudden knew everything. It's that I all of a sudden decided to not be afraid to try new things and say, okay, I don't understand this yet, right? Adding that yet, that growth mindset of just because I don't understand this yet does not mean that I'm not going to understand it. Or just because I don't understand TikTok yet. <laughs> like that was, it sounds silly. You know what I mean? Honestly, it was more like programming a website and all of this stuff. That is really when things started to change for me is when I realized I don't have to pretend like I know everyone's talking about. I don't have to feel bad that I stepped away from a career for so long. I can own that and just realize that there were reasons I stepped away. Like I can, I'm not going to have to give everyone that whole long story. Like people understand that people choose to be stay-at-home parents. And and that's actually also a little part of what I do. I mean, I'd say I'm 90% financial education, but I spend a solid 10% of my time empowering women's careers because I had a master's degree and certifications and was extremely qualified to be doing what I was doing. And I felt so ashamed. Like number one, that I didn't I couldn't help people. Number two, that it would make me a worse mom to be spending time working or to be using some kind of childcare, right? Which is completely untrue. But I felt so much shame. I was embarrassed that when I logged into my LinkedIn, I had no connections and I would send invites to people. And because dumb LinkedIn tells you, I would know that someone looked at my profile and decided not to connect with me, even though I knew them. And I, and I was talking to my husband about it and he said, oh, well, if you just knew them from church, like I only connect with people who I know from a professional sense. And I thought I was so mad because I thought I sacrificed my life to this and people want to pretend like they don't even know me now. And, and so I just realized if I'm feeling this way, guaranteed other people are. So 10% of my time I spend on, I interview people, right? Like you, like anyone who's doing any kind of thing. And they don't even have to be an entrepreneur. They don't necessarily have to be starting their own thing. I interviewed my sister who went back to school as a mom of three kids because her marriage was disintegrating. Her um, her husband uh, struggled with addiction. He has since passed away and she is remarried. But at that time she was essential. I know it was awful. She was a single mom of three kids and she went back to school Um, not to be empowered because she, but because she had to, right. It was out of necessity, but she did it. And it was, it took her four years, right. It was not an easy fix, but now she's working. She's, she is amazing. And so I just started interviewing people who are in all situations, whether they're going back to work like I did for their emotional health, whether they need to for their financial well-being, whatever it is that we're all kind of hold these insecurities and the shame of, okay, they can do it, but I can't do that. Like I'm, you know, I'm not as whatever X, Y, Z. And that's kind of why I hated social media. I don't know if you experienced this. As soon as I got in and I started staring at my follower count, I thought I just would just torture myself over not feeling good enough. And to the point where I thought I can't do this at all because it makes me feel bad. And I would have to go back to my why about why I was doing it. And now I look back at that. I literally almost quit so many times because of that. And then I just had to change my mindset of why I'm doing this. I'm not doing it for the follower count. And so I started having more one-on-one conversations with people and I'm like, okay, this is why I'm doing it. So why does it matter how many followers I have? So anyway, this is, this is a lot just to say, if you have any of those feelings of like, I'm not good enough, like I can't, I can't do this. Just realize that's, normal, but also be okay with not being okay. Or just realizing you don't understand and asking questions is you being strong and powerful and empowered. It's not, you know, it feels like, oh, this is means I don't know anything. I'm dumb. No, it means you're amazing. You're taking control of your finances, of your life, your career, whatever. So 
be, be that person who's not afraid to ask questions and it's exposure therapy, right? The first time you do it, it hurts. And then slowly over time, you know, the first time I lost a follower, oh my gosh, that just means they don't need you right now. And, you know, and I'm like, well, good for them for realizing they don't need me right now. And that's okay. So just realizing that we all have those insecurities and continuing anyway, (laughs) and then just moving on. Yes, yes, yes. (sighs) I love how you said you gave yourself permission to ask questions. I don't remember what book it was that I read. It was an older book. It was like, I don't remember. I don't remember the book, but I was reading a book and it was like by Dale Carnegie, I think. Oh uh, yeah. I know what you're talking yeah. about. I, I can picture the cover. I cannot think of the actual title, but I was reading that book. And one of the things he said, he was talking about not being the smartest person in the room that you want to surround yourself with people who know more than you. And I suddenly had the thought, oh my gosh, successful people are never the smartest person in the room. They're constantly surrounding themselves with people who know more, who have done more, who have experience they don't have so that they can grow and expand. Because right now I am limited by what I know. I'm limited by my experience. And if I want to grow past where I am right now, I have to expand into talking to people about things that I don't know about and giving yourself that permission to ask questions. Anytime somebody asks me a question on social media or an email and they say, I I don't get what you're talking about with shame, or I don't understand what you mean by self-worth versus self-esteem, or "I, I, I don't get this concept, or can you help me understand what's going on here? I've, I've tried sitting with it and I, I don't get it. I am like blown away by their bravery. I'm blown away by their courage because it takes courage and it takes a certain level of, you might feel not confident inside, but it takes a certain level of confidence to show up and say, I don't know. And it increases my respect level like a hundredfold to see people who say, I I don't know what you're talking about. Can you help me understand? And I think that's something that that we're not taught. We're not taught that asking questions, that admitting you don't understand, that continuing to get curious until you do understand is a sign of leadership. It's a sign of growth mindset. It's a sign of courage. It's, and it's so helpful moving forward in all aspects of life. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. What do they say? Questions or ignorance, leaving, leaving the body or whatever, you know, so just don't, don't stop. Right. When you hit those points, recognize them and say, oh, okay, this is what's stopping me. It's not because I can't do this. It's because I don't, I don't know how to mm-hmm. open a Roth IRA or I don't know whatever, you know, whatever it is. I, um, just realizing that really nothing needs to stop you. You know, we have limits, we have time, we mm-hmm. have, we have boundaries, but that's why it's all about setting priorities. And so realizing, okay, maybe this isn't a priority right now, but I do want to get to it. Right. Um, and that's, that's my goal, uh, was to create something that was simple enough that they could do it, um, on top of whatever they already had, you know what I mean? That it didn't have to become their new part-time job because it really doesn't I do not expect you to become me who is set on fire by spreadsheets. I joke with my husband. I'm like, oh babe, when you format a spreadsheet, it just, it does something to me. I do not expect <laughs> you to become me. That That's my goal is I realize people are busy. They don't have time. And I want people to hit their financial goals, not because it's everything that they think about, but because it's what they want and it's important to them. And I want to just give them the tools to do that as efficiently and with the least amount of effort as possible. Absolutely. Well, and The thing is, is we all have our different passions for a reason. Like you are turned on by spreadsheets and I am turned on by psych books for a reason. And I think sometimes as women, we sometimes look at other women and see their strengths and we compare ourselves and we get all like insecure. You have strengths too. Just like you talked about your friends whose houses are like perfectly decorated and they know exactly what curtains to put with what paint, with what art on the walls. And we don't think our gifts are anything special because we've lived with them our entire lives, but our gifts, it's, it's those things people come to us for all the time. It's those things people are constantly asking us questions about. It's the things people are constantly complimenting us about. It's the things that make us weird and quirky and different from other women. Like those are our gifts. 
And when we can utilize those and really tap into those and allow the other women have different gifts, we all become stronger. When we're willing to ask questions of the girl who's turned on by spreadsheets about, you know, finances and numbers and how to do all of that. And we're willing to ask the girl about interior decorating. We're willing to, you know, pull from her expertise. We're willing to pull from the girl's expertise that's really good at like healing people or really good with little kids or really good with teenagers or really good at like speaking out and being an activist. We all become better when we're willing to ask questions and when we're willing to recognize that we have strengths and our strengths are just as valuable as another person's strengths. And we aren't meant to know and have it all. We're, we're meant to lean on each other. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I, so I almost, well, actually I did technically major in economics for a brief time until I realized that I have to take a lot more calculus classes and that was not my joy. Um, But my favorite economic principle, right. As this competitive advantage that this society functions better when people do have some sort of specialization. So it is not in the world's best interest that I become a, an expert decorator. If I love doing that, great. And it's my joy. But if it doesn't bring me joy, then my time and everyone else's time is better spent if I bring in someone who does love that so that I can spend more time doing what I love, which is helping people with their finances. And so just realize that we're supposed to be different. And so if your strengths are not someone else's, all the better for the world and society. But yeah, it's funny how since I did, you know, this is kind of what I do, helping empower people with their finances. I've just found more opportunities to point out people's strengths to them and tell them this is a strength, like not, it feels natural to you. Not everyone does this. And I, it, no one yet has started a business because I told them to, but you know, maybe I'm just the first point of contact, but I hope people do because it's amazing how, how empowering it is to be spending time in your strengths. I'm actually um, speaking to a group tomorrow um, about, I have what's called a slash or portfolio career. Cause I am a financial coach. I'm also a blogger and a content creator, but I also have a full on photography business still. And I used to think, okay, like I, I started this And I didn't want to stop doing photography. And and just recently I realized, I thought at some point I'd have to choose. I'd start getting them both and then I would have to narrow down. And then one day I realized I don't have to choose. I can do them both. And then, so I was researching because as soon as I realized there was a term for it and someone wrote a book about it, it made me feel validated. And it was about the benefits of having a slasher portfolio career. And one of them, I can't remember the name of it. It was basically the positivity, um, carryover saying that if you are doing something that is a positive in your life and it makes you feel good about yourself, it will carry over to other parts of your life, the totally unrelated parts of your life, which is why it doesn't really make sense that being a financial coach would make me a better mom, but it does because spending time in that flow zone, feeling good, it makes me feel good and it makes me be a better mom. It makes me more patient. I mean, not to mention that having time away like <laughs> makes us all a little more sane. I, I know a woman who has, she has five children, four that are living and she is a nurse in a hospital. And we've all talked about like how stressful that is at any time, but especially right now. And she says that that is her me time is working at a hospital because being a stay at home mom to four kids is so much harder And it just makes you realize like, we love our kids. And I think that is a limiting belief. If we think that wanting to spend time or spending time away makes us a bad mom or a not as diligent mom or any of those things. It's, and honestly, thinking that motherhood has to come naturally to everyone. I have to read books to be a better mom, but it took stepping away and starting a business for me to just get more like I said, like realizing this doesn't come naturally to me. I might have to learn more to be better at this. You know what I mean? It's, it, it just all kind of carries over. So definitely if you're not sure what you want to do, just slowly start spending more time doing things that put you in that flow 
I, I assume ever, I love flow so much. I assume everyone knows what flow is, right? It's where your ability meets the difficulty of a task. And so, right. Maybe it's, you don't feel like you're great at something, but you enjoy doing it. And the more time you do it, the more your skills will grow. And so just definitely gravitate toward those things. Sorry. I turned this to career empowerment, also finances, but you know what I mean? Like for, even for finances too, maybe you're great at spreadsheets. And so you want to put your budget on a spreadsheet. Maybe you hate spreadsheets. So you're going to use this software, right? You, I am not of the opinion that everyone has to use the same programs to manage their finances or they need to do it, or that everyone's budget needs to look the same, that people need to not spend money on clothes or on eating out. Maybe you love eating out. Maybe that's your passion in life. And you'd rather have that than spend a lot on clothes, or maybe you love travel. Absolutely. For sure. I tell people don't, don't think you have to do everything the way that you do. You just spend some time, figure out what's important to you, do that and spend money on that. And then figure out the stuff that doesn't matter to you. And don't feel like you need to have, you know, let's say you don't care what your house looks like. I don't need to have a perfectly beautifully renovated home. I'd rather travel. That's kind of where I am. So yeah, just spending time realizing you're unique. And not only is that okay, that is your strength. I love that you actually spent some time on career empowerment too, because those are huge messages that we often receive from patriarchal societies is that men, men have many skills that they can put out into the world and women are all created for one thing, which is child rearing and housewifery and, you know, the keeping of the home. And it's, we all have gifts that we're meant to share. And I love how you said basically follow your joy. That's, that's one of my mantras is follow my joy. Does it, I use the word delicious a lot. I've had somebody point that out. Like, does it feel delicious? Is it something I enjoy? And I did give up photography for a while, mainly because of that shame you were talking about that pull between I'm gone every weekend and I'm shot, I'm shooting a wedding. I'm editing every night after my kids go to bed. I'm tired a lot, but at the same time, it gave me a sense of identity and purpose. And kind of like you with your blog, I thought to myself, if I'm just doing this when my kids are asleep and on the weekends when my husband can be here with them, then I'm not being a bad mom because they're always with a parent. They're always being taken care of. But my shame, my guilt of being you know, wanting to do something for myself and wanting to be a mom was huge. So I love that you brought that up because what I'm finding is the happier I am, the more fulfilled I am, the more I pour that joy and that fulfillment into my kids. And the more I'm able, I'm not putting that pressure on them to fulfill me. I'm fulfilled. And so they get to be whoever they want to be they get to feel like it's okay to chase their dreams. It it was actually cute. I heard my 10 year old talking to one of his friends uh, uh, several months ago. And he said, yeah, my mom works, but she's like the happiest person I've ever met. Because like you, since leaving and shedding a lot of that guilt and shame, I'm so much happier. And he just said, he's like, I want to be like her. I want to do all the things. He's really creative like me. And so he spends his evenings writing creating languages. Last night he was composing music. And when I came to listen to him, he was like, I'm doing what you do. I'm doing all the things that make me happy. And that just made me so happy to realize I was passing that on to my kids that as I follow my joy, they're learning from me, not verbally, but by what I'm doing, that it's good to follow their joy and to listen to what lights them up as well. Oh, a hundred percent. I, I think it's funny how I worried about going back to work or heaven forbid using childcare. My, my, so my kids are still at home distance learning because we're in California. And so they have a babysitter here right now. Like that's why I can work. People ask, how do you do all I do? And I said, childcare, right? Like it's some dirty secret. I have help. And what I thought was interesting about, oh, this is going to make my kids lives less rich if they have, if there's, I spend time working and it could not be more opposite. It's amazing how we can be so wrong about something. Not only are they okay, they were so much happier and they are so excited for me. When I walk out the door, they say, wow, are you going to a photo shoot? And they're giving me the pep talk because to this day, I get nervous when I walk outdoors for a photo shoot, even though I do many, 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 many 
photo shoots, I always, you know, it's that edge. I'm always a little nervous. And I told them because I'm trying to do some um, emotional intelligence, whatever, because I read it in a book, not because I'm right. And so I told them, I'm just a little nervous about for this photo shoot. And they were giving me a pep talk and they're saying, oh, mom, you always do such a good job because they love looking over my shoulder when I'm editing and they love it. My, my oldest son is more interested in my photography business. He'll come be my assistant sometimes, or he'll come, he takes pictures. And my second son is my little businessman. So he's like, how's money fit mom's going? Do you have any employees yet? He's very focused on me. I don't know why that's his main. He was like, have you grown? Is it still just you, mom? It's hilarious. He is, he's my 100%. I can't, we can't make kids the way they are, right? That's the, I think I'm so fortunate to have multiple kids. I have three kids because I realized all the guilt that I had about, oh, I made them this and all the pride I had of, oh, I'm, I'm responsible for making it this way. Just went away. I realized they are so much who they are. Um, but yeah, just realizing that that us fulfilling ourselves is going to make not us a better mom, it's going to make them a better person because you are giving them permission to also do the same. And I even when I was um in like right this high demand religion, I'd start to see that and I would talk to my friends about that when they had things they wanted to be doing and they felt really just limited where they were. And that being said, there are people who are extremely happy and fulfilled being stay-at-home parents. And always my goal when I talk about this is not to say, you need to go back to work. Not at all. I say that because I was struggling, right? But my my goal is just to bring awareness once again to these, you know, beliefs that we have and to realize that they can be wrong. And but yeah, just realizing that what we want for our kids we should also want for ourselves, right? If we want our kids to find something that brings them joy, we don't want them to be doing a job that is just drudgery that they hate, like, right? So leading by example and, oh, bonus, we're happier and a lot more fulfilled as well. And so, I mean, is it all easy all the time? No, but I cannot believe what a happier um and also, in addition to your motherhood, it's good for your marriage. If you're in a partnership, my husband always believed in me. He always knew that I was intelligent and powerful and capable. I was the one who needed to be reminded. And whenever I tell him, like, wow, like this is going really well and wow, this is profitable or whatever, he's like, yeah, no, I. I knew that. Did you not know that? And it's like, he can't believe that I thought so little of myself. And so it is good for all of your relationships that you are happy and empowered doing what you do. And also the financial, um, the financial aspect as well is also good for your marriage, right? Like getting into your finances is not going to ruin your relationship, right? Like if that's struggling, it's not going to be because you figured out your financial thing, right? Like if you are bringing awareness, it is going to make your relationship more equal and um, a healthier relationship. So I've worked with people who basically the husband was using their knowledge of the finances as something over them. And because it's common for men to be the breadwinner and for women to manage the household, it creates this really ugly dynamic of, I make the money, you spend the money. And so people talk about their finances and they feel attacked on both sides. The husband feels like if we're not meeting our financial goals, it's because I'm not doing my job of making money. And the, the one who's managing the household feels like they're being attacked because they're saying you're spending too much. And they're thinking, I'm just trying to clothe my children. I don't know what you want for me. So I like to say that budgeting can be sort of the financial counselor or therapist to help people realize like, okay, like it's not that we don't make enough. It's not that we spend too much. It's that we need to get on. We need to set some priorities, right? But yeah, everything that you do <laughs> to to work, to bring this awareness, to set intentions, to realize where your limiting beliefs are, it's going to make your relationships stronger. Yes, yes, yes. 
Uh, there's a couple things I want to touch on there. One of them was really listening to your inner knowing. You were talking about how for you and I both working really helped a lot on the motherhood front. But for some people, being a stay-at-home mom is exactly what brings them joy. And it is exactly what brings them their ultimate happiness. And really tapping into that. That's something that we're constantly talking about on this podcast is listening to your inner knowing because we all have different things that bring us joy. We all have different things that feel like the right next step for us. And so tapping into what feels good to you, what feels delicious to you. If being at home with your babies and homeschooling or, you know, being able to go to the park with them and you get ultimate fulfillment from doing that, do that. By all means, be empowered to do that. And if you're a person that wants to do that and like do a hobby that brings you a lot of joy, because I know sometimes people even feel guilty for having hobbies that take them away from their kids for an hour or two, even a couple of times a week. So if you're a painter and you want to have a hobby where you paint, do what brings you joy, because the more joy you can bring into your life, the more you're empowering your children to have joy and the more you're creating a relationship where you can meet from a place of I'm a whole human and you're a whole human and we're choosing to interact with each other from that place of wholeness instead of I feel empty and you need to fill my empty spaces because that's what we're trying to avoid creating with our kids with our husbands with our parents we're trying to avoid that codependency we're trying to avoid the you need to fill me up because I'm sacrificing for you And so instead you're saying, I fill me up, I'm empowering you to fill you up. And then we'll meet at the places where, you know, where it feels happy and joyful to interact. And I also loved how you brought up that we improve our relationships when we work on our finances. And I really liked how you pulled that apart. The, the breadwinner versus the house, like, the, the housekeeper. I don't remember what you, what you called it. The person that oh, yeah. runs the Just household. Like the, yeah. If you're managing the household. Yeah. So the manager of the household versus the breadwinner, um, that it can bring up shame for both of them when you're not meeting your financial goals, because one thinks I'm not earning enough. And the other one thinks I'm spending too much. And we know that, you know, sex, money, and the division of labor are like the top three things that are issues in marriage. And so this this financial piece is a really, really big piece. And I love that you're like, it's just a budget. When you have a budget, you can look and see, oh, we're just not prioritizing as well as maybe we could. Right. It's so funny. I just watched a TikTok last night that completely addressed both of those things. I don't know who it was, but she basically said, if you are not happy alone, you will not be happy in a relationship. She said, if you're struggling to manage $1,000, you will struggle to manage $100 thousand dollars. And I think both of those things are true because right. It just adds more to what we're already struggling with. And I don't say that to scare people. I say that to be like, okay, you can do this. Let's start small. And, um, what another, a limiting belief is I think a lot of people think that the key to, uh, financial independence, financial freedom by that, I mean, um, so, a lot of people associate retirement with old age and really what retirement is, is it's financial independence. When you no longer have to work for your income, you have invested enough that you are getting income to replace what you needed to work for, if that makes sense. And so that's a limiting belief. You can actually become financially independent. Some people have done it in their twenties, thirties. It's called the financial independence, retire early movement. And honestly, I just throw out the retire early people. Cause I think people get hung up on that. Cause I think, no, I want to work. Like, don't worry about that work towards financial independence. And whether you want to do that at 67, which is, you know, the average age, like that's great too. Um, but whatever it is, it's something to, uh, work towards. But I think that the most common, um, belief is that the key to wealth, financial independence is to make lots of money, to make more income, to increase the income. And that's actually not true. Uh, And this is why I do what I do is because it's 
that it's, it's like, no, how can that not be true? No, more money is more money. But the truth is the key to financial independence is what's called your savings rate. And savings rate is kind of a misnomer. I really mean your investment rate, the amount that you are investing on a, you can look at it monthly or annually. And the reason why is because income only gets you so far. And we've learned from history, from high net worth individuals, music artists, sports people, business people have lost everything because their spending exceeded their income. It doesn't matter how much money you make. If you are spending it all, you will never accumulate wealth. And the thing about the savings rate is it works from two ends because if you are spending less, then what that does is two two things. Number one, it increases the amount that you can invest, but it also decreases the amount that you need to be financially independent. Does that make sense? Right? Because you need a certain amount of income each year. So if you, and that's not to say that you need to live a low expense lifestyle. They have what's called the, uh, you know, fire is financial independence, retire early. They have what's called a fat fire. People who live like we, we live in an expensive area. So we know we have to build a higher amount. Even if we're not living a high lifestyle, housing here is just astronomical. So I'm not saying you need to spend as little as possible because I think that's a limiting belief too. You need to spend where it's important to you and you need to not spend on things that don't matter to you if goals such as retiring early or traveling more or you know whatever your goal is, just prioritize that. And realizing that you can do that now without increasing your income. It's just gaining an awareness of what you're spending on. And so realizing that, like she said, if you're not managing a thousand, you're not going to manage 10,000. Realize that it's not about the big, scary concepts, right? It's about the little things. Spending only on the things that matter to you not spending on the things that don't, don't not spend, not to spend, spend because you are putting it towards a financial goal. So I just uh, did this post that I'm so proud of, (laughs) took forever, but it's, I call it the million dollar plan. And I mean that very literally, I did the math on how much you would need to invest each month to accumulate a million dollars by the time that you retire. And then I put a hundred different ways to save, but the fact is there are a thousand ways. You'll read this and you'll think of more of your own that I didn't think of. I put a hundred different ways that you could get to that monthly amount. And it's not as much as you think, especially, you know, depending on when you're starting, right? And it's possible that you're already contributing that through your 401k, but just realizing It is those little things, but it's not enough just to cut expenses. You have to go to the next step of putting that investing to work for you. Just letting it sit in your cash account. Like, yes, right. Like, and I have the steps. Like, you don't need to memorize this from this conversation. You can follow along and it'll tell you, okay, build this big of an emergency fund. You know, I'll help you figure out what accounts, what the best tax advantaged accounts are, right? Like you literally have to know nothing, but realizing just not spending money is not where to stop. It's figuring out what to put that money towards and having your why about what you want to put that towards and why. And then it's exciting, right? Buying stuff feels exciting, but not buying stuff because you're going to take that trip to Greece or whatever it is, that's exciting too. But it's if you're having trouble changing your spending behavior, it's probably because you don't have your why. You don't know why you don't want to not spend. You don't have a more meaningful goal, right? You know, they always say you can't say no to something. You have to replace it with something. So I'm never going to tell you don't spend just to not spend. I'm going to say, figure out what you want, the, the stuff that excites you. What do you want? And then work towards that. And it doesn't matter if it feels unrealistic. Like that's why I'm talking about big money here with little monthly contributions because investing is incredible. I thought that people wanted to know about budgeting, but I think there's a lot more about budgeting. It's less intimidating, but I realized that investing is often where I lost people of the, where I lost people to the shame of, okay, I can budget, I can spend less, but I I'm scared to take that next step. So I talk about investing 
a lot because you're not alone. If you think, oh, I don't, I don't know how to invest or I'm not sure what I'm doing, but it's amazing how quickly people can go from not knowing anything, investing, feeling intimidated to not only understanding, but being excited and thrilled. So I'm on uh, right now because I'm, I'm building the challenge right now. People can join at any point and it takes them to the beginning and then they just slowly catch up to us. I have like an email funnel that takes them to where I am. But I just did the step where people computed their savings and investing rate. And every person got so excited to tighten up their budget in a good way, not in a limiting way, but in a like, oh, I'm so excited because this is what I want. And I know that I can do this. You know what I mean? It, they just, it's amazing how quickly they can become empowered. Oh, so what I'm hearing as you're talking about this is a principle of essentialism that I had to learn in my business because I wanted to say I'm a multi-passionate person, kind of like you. I could have like multiple slash careers and be very, very excited to go to work every day, but you don't accomplish anything if you have too much on your plate, right? If you say yes to everything, then essentially you're saying no to the things that are most important to you. And it sounds like that's what happens in finances as well is you're not just saying no to things. That's what I think a lot of us think of sometimes when we think of budgeting is that we're going to live this smaller life and we have to say no to all of these things and we have to get rid of all of these things. But it's not that. It's what am I most excited to say yes to and how can I take more of my funds and push it towards that so that we accomplish that goal sooner and with more impact and with more momentum so it's not just tiny little trickles going there and it never really gets where we want it to go. How can we make that our sole focus and say yes to that with intention so that our money is going boom, right there. And we're getting more of the things that really, really matter to us. Oh, perfect. I like what <laughs> I need that sound bite, and I want to put it out there because that is exactly how I feel. And I think realizing that principle of what am I saying yes to? Because if you're just trying to say no to things, you're just going to feel bad and you're going to get burnt out and you're going to quit. It's about what are you saying yes to? What is important to you? And then the rest just falls into place as you work towards that. So yeah, absolutely. That is my goal. And it's, it's working all the feedback I'm getting. They're excited. They went from thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. And I barely think that it matters to, Oh, I'm so excited. Like, guess what I did. And it's really just that little step of realizing what do I want? Oh, and I can have that. Oh, and yeah, like, let's do this. I, I, I thought that I'd have to spend a lot of time talking about budgeting, but I found I almost not skipped over it, but I realized it was never about spending. You know what I mean? It was always about not knowing why it was worth spending less. Or you know what I mean? Once people figured out why and understanding that they could through investing that, you know what I mean? That they didn't have to sacrifice as much as they think to get to their goals. They naturally changed their spend, you know what I mean? And work towards that. And so absolutely, it's about, what are you saying yes to? What are you excited about? And then I'm just, I don't know, strapping on the turbo gear to make them realize they can do this and it's exciting and they, they are on fire. I don't have to fire them up anymore. Once I just tell them how investing works, essentially, if you are getting a 7% return on average, which is for the typical stock market. I mean, I don't want to get overly technical, but basically that's taking into account the average long-term and return of the stock market minus inflation. So a 7% return doubles your investment every approximately every decade. Does that make sense? And that's why what you can do now matters even more than what you can do 40 years from now, because that amount is going to double, 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 right? It's exponential, right? 16 times. It will be worth 16 times more 40 years from now than what it's worth now. And that's why people get excited because they think, oh man, like this is my wealth creation years. And so, but you know, everyone's different. Some people are like, you know what? I love my job. I want to work up until 67. And I think that's awesome that they found a career that they love that much. And they're like, I don't want to sacrifice more now. Like I'm happy with where I am, you know what I mean? As long as they're meeting their minimums. And that's why I help you figure out, okay, how much do you need to do each month to get on track for just an average retirement? And it's like, cool. If that's where you are and that's where you want to be, like, absolutely. I am not here to talk anyone into trying to just invest for the sake of investing. But 
it's amazing um, how much people have to learn who already know a lot. I've worked with someone who's a VP of finance, who has a CPA, who's amazing. She's a genius, so much smarter than I am, but I still had to talk her into, she. they had way too much um, cash, which is like a good problem to have. But at the same time, all the conversation I had was not about investing. It was like, okay, you clearly have enough to meet your needs. Do you have any hopes to create something beyond what your family can do? And she had this amazing idea for a creating basically a business center that would empower people from disadvantaged backgrounds and people like me could come and volunteer their services to help these people, not only, you know, like teaching someone to fish, creating generational wealth through building businesses. And it was amazing, right? But you need to be able to pay for a space and write all these things. And I mean, I don't, I don't know if she's doing it, but just realizing that there are reasons beyond you and meeting your needs to maximize what you can do with your financial resources. And so just, you know, cause I think also we have this shame around money of having money is bad or selfish, or, you know, you can own, like, and just realizing, okay, we have this opportunity. We have tax breaks for using these investment accounts. Even if you already have enough for your family, you know, my husband and I, we want to create a foundation. Like our, we're teaching our kids how to, create their own wealth, they are not going to be dependent on what we leave when we leave this life. We're leaving that to an organization or, you know what I mean? Creating something that will live beyond us. And so even if you feel like you have enough, that can also be a limiting belief of there's no reason for me to figure out my finances because we have enough. We're fine. We're on track for retirement. There might still be, if you could die with a $5 million state, what would you want that to go to? And that's kind of our reason for continuing to, I mean, we live our best life every day doing what we want. I, um, I create these businesses and I always say it's amazing because I get paid to only work when I want and only do what I want to do. I'm so lucky. So it's not that we're like, constantly ignoring our kids and just working all the time. But it's like, after, you know what I mean? After I go to bed, we spend three nights of the week together. We work four evenings a week, but it's because it doesn't really feel like work. It's because we're doing something that we feel like is meaningful, but it's also because we spend more time during the day because we, you know what I mean? Like I spent all yesterday just hanging out with my little guy, building Legos, doing finger paints, whatever, you know what I mean? Anyway, just throwing out the conventions of you only need as much money for you and being like, there's reasons to figure this out. And it's not something to feel drudged about. It's something to feel excited about because the possibilities are endless. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was kind of how I was planning to like wrap up the call is this idea that because we have enough for ourselves that there's no reason to want to invest or to, to have any more because really what it is is when we have extra wealth, we get to then use it to either enrich our own lives or to bless the lives of other people. And so many people do choose to create foundations or to advocate for people who can't advocate for themselves or to create clean water or figure out inventions. I look at Bill and Melinda Gates a lot of the time and what they're doing with their wealth and it inspires me. And that's how you know what you want to do is watching people who are doing something and like paying attention to that little pang of like, even envy or jealousy, like that little, oh, that would be nice. That happens inside of you. Those are, those are clues to what your yeses are and what you would like to do in the world and what you would like to have more of in your life. And I, the principles that you're teaching help people fulfill those needs, those wants, those desires, and to really like amplify the good that they want to do in the world. So money is not evil. It can be the root of some crazy amounts of good. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think it's okay to have a good life, to travel, to be happy. Um, and it's, it's okay to accumulate wealth, right. To be able to use it towards good causes the things that we're able to do because we started investing early are amazing. And we're so fortunate and money is not evil. <laughs> it's not the root of all evil. Um, but realizing just making little ways to give back now, whether it's with your time or your money is really 
the best thing that you can help your kids inherit are just good values and kindness. We, our kids can go on about the things that we love about people that we try to help. Um, and that's really the best thing that they can inherit from us. So. Yes. Oh, this has been amazing. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Uh, no, just people find me. If you like this, uh, you can go to moneyfitmoms.com and join the money fit challenge. And I say that just because I love it. I think that it's, it helps people, but know that I'm also here and I answer messages. You know, I'm at that stage. I have like a little over a thousand followers and I still answer messages and I love it. So if you get to a place where you're stuck, don't stay there, ask for help. Um, and yeah, just feel great about what you're doing. And the fact that you're listening about it today, because it means that the kind of people who are listening to this are people who are empowered. And so just keep going on the path you're going on. Mm -hmm. Good, good stuff. Thank you so much for taking time to visit with me today, to talk about these principles, to share all of the materials that you're creating on your website, for all of the conversations that I know you're having on Instagram and TikTok, and just for taking all that knowledge and passion and excitement you have for spreadsheets. Thank you for sharing that with the world. Thank you for being willing to show up and be brave and be quirky and be yourself because it blesses all of us and it allows all of us to expand and grow and get the lives that we want and deserve as well. So thank you for being here today. Awesome. Thank you for all you do, Terry. I appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. All right, you guys. We will see you next week. And don't forget if this episode was really helpful for you to share it with friends and family. The more we share, the more good we can do in the world, the more we can help people really shed those fear and shame tapes that all hold us back and help us get the lives that we want, help us get those joyful, authentic lives. So I look forward to seeing you next Sunday and thanks for tuning in today.